Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's international webinar. I am Venita, your moderator for this international webinar series of Bodhidharma University about computational materials modeling for nanotechnology. We are so excited for our keynote speaker today. We have Professor Fargi Swami, Associate Professor at Monash University, Malaysia. Well, I wish everyone who's joining this event is in good health. Now we have about 100 participants who's joining us via Zoom application, also YouTube by stream, and it's still going up. So thank you and welcome. And here are the rules during this event. I will read it for you. Okay, the first microphones of all participants will be automatically muted during the presentation. And then please send your questions or comments as a private message to the account name Q&A for Zoom users. And please use comment section on YouTube for participants using YouTube. It's about 15 minutes for Q&A. And then for those who are willing to ask questions, or to give comments verbally, then please raise your hand and you will be unmuted by the host during Q&A quest session. And the last one, you will be provided with a link that will be used to generate e-certificate via chat on Zoom and via comment section on YouTube. Okay, before we begin, I would like to ask Dr. Titi Limajatini as the Vice Rector on behalf of Rector of Bodhidharma University, Dr. Sofian Sugiyoko, and also Mr. Udaya as advisor to supervisory institution to give the opening speech. All right, Dr. Titi, please welcome giving the speech first. Okay, thank you. Yes. The Honorable Chairman of Buntek Bio, Mr. Witan Lee. Yeah. The Honorable our Advisor of Buntek Bio, Mr. Udaya Nimalata Halib, who are in Perth, Australia now. Uh, the Honorable our Admirable Guest Speaker of today's webinar, Associate Professor Fargesi Swami from Monas University, Malaysia. Thank you for your time and presence in this webinar. Thank you everyone from across Indonesia, Pakistan, India, China, and Taiwan for coming to international webinar. As our rector of Bodhidharma University, I wish you a good morning and good health. Good evening and good health. Yeah. Uh, first, we are grateful for God for his blessing we are able to gather here with our webinar to attend this seminar, this international webinar with the theme Computational Material Modeling for Nanotechnology. This webinar is Bodhidharma Uni University third successful international webinar series with more than 1,000 registered participants. This webinar is an active contribution of Bodhidharma University yeah, to support the development of science and technology that has been rapidly advancing to better the human life. Yeah. Once again, let us big thanks to Associate Professor Fargesi Fami. I wish you always in good health and well-being. Hope one day you can come to our campus. I also give my thanks to Dr. Amin Suyitno as the Dean of Science and Technology Faculty, Ms. Felita yeah, as the moderator, Ms. Ramona as head of the physics study program, yeah. the entire webinar committee, and thanks to all attendants. You make this webinar possible and success. Lastly, Enjoy, please enjoy this uh, today's webinar. I hope the knowledge being shared today is able to help the advancement of science. Good, good evening to everyone. One again, uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Titi, for your speech. And next, Mr. Udaya, please welcome. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the advisory body of the University of Bodhidharma, I would like to thank Professor Fargis Swami, our distinguished speaker today, for your generosity to share your knowledge in a webinar entitled Computational, uh, Computational Materials Modeling for Nanotechnology. We do know that nanotechnology is the science and technology of very small things, in particular, things that are less than 100 nanometers in size. The area of nanoscience and nanotechnology has become increasingly important in various applications and branches of science, comprising the area of uh, comprising physics, chemistry, biology, material science, medicine, environmental science, management science, and in particular, computational science as the topic of our webinar today in providing a profound impact on our daily lives. We cannot avoid that we touch nanotechnology every day as nanotechnology is enabled by very tiny materials called nanomat nanomaterials and are already inside many of the products we use every day. Nanomaterials in their application are still being discovered and there are endless possibilities for a new generation of, of STEM or STEM because nanotechnology combines concepts from the entire spectrums of science, technology, engineering, and math. A recent research revealed that 80% of the fastest growing occupations depends on STEM skills. STEM occupations are growing 70% annually. So I do hope this webinar will give the insight for our students to be ready to enter the challenging yet tightly competitive 4.0 industrial revolution. So without further ado, I will end up my welcome speech by once again, thanking Dr. Swami and the committee who have worked hard to make things happen successfully. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Udaya for your speech. And now I would like to read a short biography of Professor Fargisi Swami. Uh, Dr. Fargisi Swami, Chartered Engineer UK, is currently working as Associate Professor in Mechanical Engineering at Monash University, Malaysia. After obtaining philosophy licensure and PhD degrees from Uppsala University, Sweden, he worked at various places, including Max Planck for Materials Research in Stuttgart, Germany, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO Australia, Eco Polytechnic de Montreal, Canada, and Monash University, Australia. He serves in the editorial board of Metallurgical and Materials Transactions at Springers and is a member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, UK, High Pressure Science Society of America, High PSSA Life and Australian Ceramic Society as life member. His research interests include nanomaterials for energy, photovoltaic solar cells, fuel additive, bioimaging and drug delivery, and device applications, advanced characterization of nanomaterials, size, shape, and strength nanomaterials, nanomechanical properties, and first principles atomistic and thermodynamic computations and modeling. His teaching interests include engineering design with materials, material selection, sustainability, and life cycle engineering. Okay, now it's time to listen and pay attention to the presentation that will be delivered by our keynote speaker. Please welcome Professor Fargisi Swami. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it. Beautiful. I'm sorry. Uh, I apologize for the technical problem. Uh, it happens occasionally. Oh, it's okay. Now, let me thank um, uh, Finita for the kind introduction and also Dr. Jacob Beethan for inviting me to deliver this webinar at um, Universitas Bhutidharma. 
Uh, in fact, I'll be presenting a bit of uh, Jacob Nathan's work later as part of the webinar. Now, I want to start by showing a slide uh, from uh, Dr. Nicola. Professor Nicola Marsari, EPFL. Um, it comes from his fireside chats in lockdown times, COVID lockdown times, and it's about how um, computational modeling is progressing. And this title is More Optimism, as you can see. Uh, some of the titles he has highlighted, the high throughput highway to computational materials design towards the computational design of solid catalysts, materials prediction, fueling discovery by sharing, and finally, are experiments still necessary? That's a very bold statement to make. Do we still need experiments or just computational modeling should do the job for our research? Now, what computational modeling allows us to do is to, so historically it has allowed us to understand and interpret experimental data and also to share that knowledge uh, in some form or the other. But at this stage, the computational material science has progressed to a level where we can actually predict materials, unknown materials and their unknown properties. And especially in experimentally uh, inaccessible, difficult conditions. So it's a good time to be doing materials uh, research using computational material science. I have taken this um, um, table from one of the articles which appeared in Nature Reviews materials where the, author, the authors have listed many applications. I'm just showing two of them, um, lithium ion batteries and hydrogen production and storage where computational material science predicted new materials and their properties that are relevant to these applications before experiments confirmed these things. So you can see that a lot of uh, progress has been made in this field and it's a fantastic time to, uh, to be presenting this type of a webinar. So what am I planning to do today? I am plan uh, considering that uh, a large number of the participants in the, web in the webinar are students, I'm trying to keep it at a very simple level. So what I'm going to do is to talk mainly a couple of uh, computational methodologies as applied to predicting the mechanical behavior of materials. Why mechanical behavior? Uh, in fact, mechanical behaviors are the, uh, the easiest to compute and in fact, the most accurate results are obtained when we are talking about mechanical uh, properties. And it's also easier to explain and understand, uh, particularly for undergraduate students. So I'm not going to discuss any particular method in detail. I will try to keep the jargons away from it and uh, from this webinar. I'll just use the essential terminology and try to explain things in uh, a simple manner. In fact, what I've been trying to do in my research career is to combine both uh, experimental and um, theoretical work together, theoretical meaning computational work together. So I will present some of my work um, that's done under my supervision or what I have carried out myself on titanium dioxide nanomaterials and boron nitrate materials. I will go through these things in a bit, uh, in some detail, particularly the titanium dioxide work and it's uh, the reason for uh, carrying out computational work. So as I mentioned, my work, uh, my research combines both computational and experimental uh, components. On the computational component, I've been historically doing computational thermodynamic modeling of material systems uh, for steels and ceramic systems, etc. Then I moved to atomistic modeling using interatomic potentials. And then subsequently I moved to first principle calculations. So at the moment I'm combining both atomistic and first principles calculations and not doing much of 
computational thermodynamic um, research. I will explain these uh, terms uh, in a bit in um, simple terms. So on the experimental side, I've been doing experimental phase diagrams using ceramics methods and in situ high pressure, high temperature experimentation, trying to find what structure would be stable under a given set of pressure temperature or atmosphere. I've been using uh, spectroscopic techniques, particularly Raman method, Raman spectroscopy, which are very useful for characterizing nanoscale materials. And I have also been using synchrotron X-ray diffraction and lab-based X-ray diffraction. The synchrotron diffraction is important because uh, when we are dealing with nanomaterials, we are dealing with minute uh, particles and to get some good uh, diffraction out of those things, you need to use high energy synchrotron uh, type of things. So I have been using synchrotrons in um, Europe, the ESRF and uh, the major installation in APS that's in Chicago and also uh, the Spring 8 synchrotron in Japan. Um, I hope I can explain some of these um, work on these oxides using this both experiment and theory and see and show you how these things go hand in hand. In hand. So when we are talking about computational materials uh, modeling, we are talking about a range of topics, which includes quantum mechanics, molecular dynamics, mesoscale meso modeling, et cetera. I've captured here the most commonly used methodologies. You can, in fact, add to this computational modeling or um, um, artificial intelligence and many other techniques. I'm just going to discuss uh, the most commonly used methods of which I will only be discussing a subset, mainly quantum mechanics and molecular dynamic calculations. So this figure presents the same thing in a bit more pictorially, less boring if you like, uh, manner. So when we are talking about quantum mechanical calculations, uh, we are talking about the smallest size of the system and the fastest time uh, scale that we are concerned with. So we are talking about uh, uh, processes that happen at the electronic structure level, meaning bond making, bond breaking, reactivity, et cetera. So that's the smallest um, scale, but the fastest, uh, fastest um, uh, process that um, I am going to discuss. And then of course, when you go up the scale in um, length and um, time, we are talking about atomistic models. Here, we are not explicitly talking about electrons. We are not worried about the subatomic particles such as electrons and uh, the nuclear components, protons, neutrons, etc. We are treating atom as a whole. So the example technique that I'm going to talk about is molecular dynamics here. So I will leave the others, uh, the dislocation dynamics, et cetera, uh, uh, for the moment. Um, I'm not going to discuss that. Interested people may look up uh, plenty of uh, information out there on the web and um, in the literature. So just to get started, uh, especially for students who are not familiar with this field, when we are talking about an interatomic potential or a force field, we are talking about the total energy of the system, let's say if we are assuming two atoms interacting with each other, how that, that total energy varies as a function of the atomic separation. So in the beginning, when these two atoms are separated far apart, so-called infinite separation, the atoms don't feel each other. But when they come together at some point, they start feeling each other and they feel an attraction towards each other. And as a result, the attractive energy, which is shown here in vertical axis in the negative side of this line and in bottom of this line, that starts increasing the attractive energy. Um, and that's what is shown here. And it increases to the level uh, at the bottom here where you can say the two atoms are in at equilibrium separation. Now, if you come uh, try to if you try to compress the two atoms any further, they try they start 
repelling each other. So the repulsive energy goes up. So this is essentially an interatomic potential energy curve. There are many formulations available to discuss interatomic potentials, uh, including simple pair potentials, meaning two atoms interacting with each other. Examples include the Leonard Jones potential, Morse potential, Buckingham potential, etc. You can also include one more atom, three atom, etc. It can complicate it. So that's how the interatomic potentials are uh, formulated. They are just mathematical functions describing the energy of the system as a function of the particle separation. I talked about quantum mechanics as um, dealing with electrons explicitly so that we can look at reactivity, bond formation, bond breaking, et cetera. We can also calculate the total energy of the system quite accurately. And then we have the interatomic potential, the empirical interatomic potential that I described, where we deal with the atoms as a whole, not worried about the subatomic particles. So when we are talking about quantum on the one hand, quantum mechanical calculations, there are no fitted parameters that are used in the modeling. So that's why they are called ab initio simple calculations or first principles calculations, meaning what we are trying to do is to solve um, a Schrodinger equation of a system of a, a many body system using approximations. As you know, it's not easy to solve Schrodinger equations when the particle number increases. So that's the quantum uh, mechanical approach where no fitted parameters are used other than some simple approximations. So that's why we are able to predict reactivity and also the energetics, energies of different materials. On the other hand, when we are talking about the empirical potentials, the atoms are treated as a whole. And most often these uh, partition functions are parameters that are fitted to experiments or other first principle calculation results. So it's a, it is an empirical approach where fitting is important. And as a result, unlike the quantum method, the empirical potentials are not very good at predicting things that go beyond the systems that have been used or the data that have been used to fit the empirical potential. And you can't talk about reactivity or energetics uh, in an absolute scale, an absolute sense using empirical potentials. So in between say what are called reactive uh, interatomic potentials, and these are an emerging class of interatomic potentials. They try to have uh, capture some of the reactive uh, reactivity aspect from quantum mechanical uh, approach. And also at the same time use the the force field or the empirical interatomic potential approach so they can be done quite simply and faster. With the quantum mechanical calculations, which are, because we are using a lot of electrons, we are dealing with a lot of electrons, the computation uh, gets uh, very intense, very expensive, and you, you can't model large systems. Whereas with um, empirical potentials, because it's a simplistic approach, we can increase the number of atoms at the same time, you can get it done quite fast. So that's uh, all I'm going to talk about the methodology. And this figure shows a uh, comparison of um, energy, dissociation energy for two types of uh, species, BH3 and BH4, calculated using quantum mechanics shown here in red here for BH4 and corresponding reacts FF calculation shown here. You can see that similarly for BH3 here, you can see that um, the reacts FF method, although it is um, atomistic, it captures the energetics uh, quite well, very close to the quantum mechanical um, results. That's because many of the reacts FF interatomic potential models are parametrized or the parameters are uh, derived um, using ab initio or first principles uh, calculation results. Okay, 
Now, I will uh, get straight into uh, TaO2, titania or titanium dioxide. My interest in titanium dioxide started when I was working in CSIRO. At that time, we were looking at um, processing ilmenite, iron titanium oxide, which is a natural mineral we see in uh, beach sands, so it's a dark sands, processing of that mineral to extract titania. That's the work I started off with, and um, I was planning to create a computational thermodynamic model uh, for the, the ilmenite extraction. But when I looked at the into the data in the literature, I realized there isn't much available even for titanium dioxide or the TIO system. So I, that's where I uh, got started with TIO2. So initially I did some computational thermo, thermo, thermodynamic calculations, and then I extended that to atomistic modeling of uh, titanium oxygen system. And in fact, uh, uh, I, in collaboration with Professor Gale, uh, he was at Imperial College at that time, we produced a transferable variable charge intratomic potential. It's an intratomic potential that can be transferred one from one titanium stoichiometry, that is TiO2 to Ti2O3, Ti4O7, et cetera. Um, and without any serious problem, it was doing a good job. So that was published in 2000, long time ago. And then I also started some um, quantum mechanical calculations to completely map out, actually not completely map out, to find some of the missing phases in the titanium dioxide phase diagram. And subsequently, I did, I, I, we found some interesting results uh, when we looked at the titanium dioxide phase diagram, especially at high pressures. And then I was uh, trying to see if those phases can be stabilized at the nanoscale. When we say nanoscale, they are, uh, we are talking about um, sizes of 100 nanometers or less. And let's look at the reason why we should be working on TAO2 to begin with, because it is for nanotechnology. Titanium dioxide has some fantastic properties. They are fantastic photoactive materials. That means that uh, they are able to absorb sunlight and do something with it. Uh, Anatase is commonly used in many of these applications. Then Protail has uh, very high dielectric constants. They are thermally stable, non-toxic. Uh, non it's quite abundant and they are non-corrosive, et cetera. And including they are biocompatible. That means that they can be used in food and other uh, applications, including pharmaceuticals. So that's why these applications are there, pigments, catalysts, sunscreens, sensors, food additives and pharmaceutical additives, including your sunscreens, uh, which we commonly use. Uh, solar cells, that's where the nanostructured titanium dioxide comes in, uh, particularly the anatase phase. Uh, in fact, the dye-sensitized solar cell uh, by Oregon and uh, Gretzel was based on actually the efficiency of the solar cell was improved a lot when they used nanostructured anatase uh, on which the dye was coated and the dye was absorbing sunlight and pumping in the electrons into the solar cell. There have been also tier two phases have also been uh, considered as anode materials in fuel cells and many, many applications. Um, in fact, I said I was looking for some missing phases. One of the phases I was looking for was the, uh, the fluoride st uh, structured phase, uh, so-called cubic uh, TiO2. And then in this process, we came across a highly inc uh, incompressible oxide structure called the cotonite TiO2. Cotonite is lead chloride, but TiO2 can take that crystal structure. So we call it cotonite TiO2. And here we can see the temperature pressure phase diagram of titanium dioxide. So the pressure is along the x-axis and temperature along the y-axis. You can see that the stable phase at ambient conditions, when we say stable, thermodynamically stable, not kinetically stable. Uh, phase is rutile, represented by R, that transforms to an alpha PbO2 structure, the structure 
of the material uh, of the alpha PBO2 uh, mineral, it's called columbite. And if you compress that further, it becomes a monoclinic structure. Then it becomes another orthorhombic structure. And later on, uh, with further com compression, this uh, cotonate structure is formed, which is the lead chloride structure. Upon further com compression to very high pressures, we are dealing with huge pressures here, it assumes what's called an Fe2, Fe2P structure, which is uh, shown here. So and the missing phase I was looking for, cubic TAO2, different people have come up with different crystallographic uh, structure for that. This is the PA3 is the pyrite structure, FM3M is the fluoride structure, and the other structures are given here. And when we are talking about uh, TAO2 uh, uh, commonly, we are talking about phases like anatase, brookite, et cetera, which are metastable phases, meaning these phases are not thermodynamically stable, but they are stabilized in nature because of the kinetic uh, reasons. I'll be talking a bit about anatase later. Um, I was, uh, I mentioned earlier, I was interested in uh, high pressure or the mechanical behavior of these materials and how is uh, uh, experiment, how is the experiment carried out? Uh, for the experimental study of um, materials under high pressure and temperature, we use what's called a diamond anvil cell here. That's what is shown here symbolically. These are two diamond crystals and on the top of, uh, one phase and bottom of the other phase, we put a metal gasket, uh, uh, drill a small hole, uh, 300 nanometer, uh, micrometers or whatever. And you stuff in the sample there and put some pressure transmitting medium so that you have a hydrostatic pressure, like what you uh, experience when you go inside a swimming pool, that type of pressure, equal pressure all around you. And then you squeeze these two diamonds from opposite ends and then through the diamond, you can send an X-ray at synchrotrons and collect the data and see what structure you get out of it. That's the experiment uh, typically done to study pressure temperature phase diagrams. And the cotonite structure, which I said we found was actually a product of two approaches. One was the experimental approach together with first principles calculations. This was done in collaboration with uh, people in Germany, and this was published a long time ago. The interesting thing is titanium exists in, in a particular coordination environment in, in relation to oxygen. Titanium is coordinated to nine oxygen, and that was not known uh, until that point, which means that it is highly packed. The polyhedra here, shown here, this one and here, this here, they are titanium oxygen polyhedra where each titanium atom is surrounded by nine oxygen in the crystal structure. And that gives a huge uh, bulk modulus, which means you can't compress this material. It is highly incompressible. And at that time we measured a hardness of something like 38, which is very high. Actually, subsequently we found it was slightly less than that. That's not important. So we have produced what may be considered an al the ultra hard ultra um, most incompressible oxide uh, phase of TAO2 at that time. That's why it got published in a good journal. Now, I said it was a combination of both um, experiment and uh, computational studies that gave us all these results. Here, I'm showing a table which shows various titanium dioxide phases and the titanium oxygen coordination polyhedral number here, the coordination number here. And the on the right side, uh, rightmost uh, entry here on this column is the bulk modulus computer using quantum mechanical methods. And in between we have both experiment and another computational approach, which is uh, again, another version of uh, quantum mechanical calculation can see that in good agreement with the experimental data given uh, here, we were able to calculate all the uh, model life, bulk model life for all the phases uh, in the TAO2 system. And now, why did I talk about all these things? 
to show that uh, there is a rich uh, variety of faces available in this face diagram. And, and some of those faces are ultra hard, some are highly incompressible, and they also have beautiful photoactive properties. So if we can stabilize some of these faces at the nanoscale, then we are talking about uh, great applications, including nanoscale coatings and uh, tribol uh, tribological applications, et cetera. So that was the motivation to start some study on um, nano titania. And uh, what you see here is a metastable phase diagram to the left where pressure versus crystallite size of anatase is shown. So the ex these are experimental results. What you see on the x-axis is the crystallized, crystallite size, the average crystallite size of your sample, starting with four nanometers up to 64 and beyond. And the vertical axis is the pressure. So when you start off with anatase of, let's say, six nanometers here, when you compress the material in diamond angle cell, it stays metastably up to about 30 gigapascals instead of transforming to the phases I discussed earlier. And eventually it amorphizes. But if you start with a slightly coarser anatase uh, sample, nanoparticle, what happens is that this structure straight away transforms to the monoclinic structure, high pressure phase. So this is a crystal to crystal transition, here crystal to amorphous transition. Now, if you go to much coarser size, bigger than 50 nanometers in size and up to micro particle size, if you squeeze anatase in this diamond cell, uh, what you see is that at some pressure, actually at lower pressure, you will see it transforming to the alpha PBO2 structure, which is the correct transformation uh, uh, as predicted by thermodynamics. So we are able to see three size channels here. And if you start with rutile, another phase, you find two channels, but not the amorphous phase. Uh, if you analyze the data, the compression data of a uh, six nanometer anatase uh, up to about 30 GPA. What you see is that uh, these are the cell parameters plotted as a function of pressure. The cell parameter initially a parameter compresses and at some point in pressure about um, 12 GPA, it gets stiffer. That means it's harder to compress along this direction. Similarly for C uh, um, parameters also. So if you plot the volume, you can see that there's a sudden break in the compression curve. That means the material is stiffening. And this was at that time an interesting result and the APS, the advanced photon source uh, put up this as a science highlight uh, in their website. Anyway, why am I saying this? Uh, is to show that the behavior of nanoscale material and bulk material are different. And in this diagram, what, what is shown is similar work, but this time the titanium dioxide anatase is doped with a bit of zircon. Instead of titanium, 10% zircon, zirconium is in the, in the materials. And it, you see it's very similar behavior, very erratic behavior. It compresses, normally most materials compress smoothly, but in this case, when you deal with nanomaterial, it compresses up to a point smoothly and then it flattens, means it becomes stiffer. So there's a lattice hardening is the term used happening at some high pressure. To the right, um, what you showed is again, the same zirconium containing anatase compressed initially. This number one shows the compression. And then you leave it there, the, the curve breaks here. And when you decompress, that means you release the pressure, it follows a different path and gets here. Now, if you start again with that decompressed material and again pre-compress it, you come this way. So there's a hysteretic problem here. So something is happening to the material. But the question is, how can we understand this using um, 
computational methodology. And that's what I'm going to discuss uh, after I briefly talk about another TAO2 structure called TAO2B. This is not my work. This is the work from literature. They have also found titanium dioxide phase B. It is another metastable structure, very similar to Anatase. When you take nanoparticles of 15 or 20 nanometer particles and compress, as, it, as you increase the pressure, you can see that uh, the material becomes amorphous. You can see the, um, the diffraction peaks disappearing at sub around 12 or 13 GPA, and then it becomes disordered. So two materials acting very similarly. Now the question is, how can we model this? So in order to model realistic titanium nanoparticles, it's pretty hard. Actually, there's a good review in 2018 by Coetal that discussed the various approaches to modeling realistic nanoparticles, uh, mostly using quantum mechanical calculations. But um, in terms of the computational effort and the computational demand, it's huge. So what I was thinking is, can we look at the structure uh, from a periodic crystal point of view? When we say periodic crystal, we are assuming that the crystal is uh, infinitely large. That's how most um, quantum mechanical calculations are carried out. We assume the crystal to be uh, infinite in three dimensions. So that allows you to do a lot of mathematical approximations and a lot of um, steps you can bypass and get uh, results. So can we uh, use a, a periodic system approach and understand this material? When you do experiments with the bulk anatase that transforms to alpha PBO2, or thrombic structure at something like six or eight GPA. But when we are doing computational studies, it is possible to compute the structural evolution in its metastable state. That means beyond what you might find in experiment, you can push it further in pressure and see what might happen to the structure. So I computed the TAO2 annotase using um, quantum mechanical method called density functional theory, but uh, a hybrid density functional theory uh, very accurately. This is a predicted structure pre very close to the experiment. And what is shown here is a polyhedral uh, representation of the annotated structure with a TI in the middle uh, of this polyhedron and oxygen red uh, balls here. TI is shown by T that this is the vertical axis C and A is uh, looking down the page and B's uh, left to right, you can see that there are different types of coordinations. So in order to understand what might happen to the titanium oxygen coordination, we can uh, label them as apical, meaning towards the apex of the octahedron, which is vertical bond TAO, and equatorial, that is the, along the equator of the polyhedron, that is identified as the here with the uh, equatorial sign showing here, titanium oxygen bond. So that's what is shown here. Now, if you, I talked about zirconium earlier. If you look at the periodic table, titanium, zirconium, hafnium, they are all group four uh, metals. So you might think zirconium should also, uh, can also form a similar structure uh, to um, titanium, uh, when it forms the oxide structure. But if you look at the phase diagram, this shown here, that's not the case. Here, the binary phase diagram of zirconium dioxide and titanium dioxide is shown. And you can see that uh, at um, low temperatures, you start with anatase. It's not heated or anything. Anatase is the starting material. And if you put some zirconium in it, it can take up some zirconium in the anatase structure. But if you go to the pure zirconium dioxide material, it is a monoclinic phase that we have seen in the case of uh, titanium dioxide at high pressure, and that is what is present. 
And in between, if you try to mix these two materials without annealing or doing anything, you end up getting amorphous materials. So, but if you heat the anatase, anatase TaO2 at some high temperature, it transforms to a rutile structure, which is the stable phase. Uh, whereas the monoclonic zirconium eventually melts and uh, becomes a tetragonal zirconium and then it melts. So you can see that there are different structures. So now if I want to study what might happen to a zirconium dioxide anatase, what can I do? I go back to the same approach. I make a metastable zirconium anatase. I compute it, predict using uh, quantum mechanical calculations. And then I try to see what might happen to this structure if I apply pressure to it. I also mentioned titanium uh, dioxide bronze or B structure earlier, which behaves very similarly to anatase. So this is what I did. I computed these structures. And in fact, uh, this is the polyhedron, the coordination of titanium on, uh, in uh, titanium TO to B structure. There are two types of poly uh, polyhedra here, characterized by TO, TIO1, O and TA2, O structure. And the bond lengths are calculated very close to what, what's um, obtained experimentally and using some other uh, initial calculation. So it's highly predictive. Now we can rely on this calculation to tell us what might happen if I uh, do a computational experiment by taking this material through um, high pressure. So one thing you need to pay attention to here is there are two uh, types of bonds here. The TiO2 O3L bond is much larger, 2.136. Similarly, this is another larger bond. But, uh, and here in this case, the TiO2L bond, that's also quite large, but the other bonds are smaller. So there are two types of bonds uh, in this structure. Now, if you compute uh, the pressure evolution, pressure dependence of the structure on these metastable phases, what well, you see that you can more or less reproduce the, the lattice hardening in the case of anatase. You can see that the structure evolves and then becomes flattens, uh, flattens and it becomes harder to compress along A axis, while along B axis, it, uh, along C axis, it is, um, evolving normally and it becomes easier to compress with pressure. If you look at um, the zirconium equivalent, you don't see a similar case. You see a smooth evolution of um, the lattice parameters with pressure. And if you pay attention to the bonds I was talking about, the TIO apical bond that is parallel to C, the vertical uh, axis, you can see that that evolves and finally becomes more compliant compared to the TIO equatorial bond. So there's a bond crossover happening somewhere around 14 gigapascals according to the calculation. But you don't see a similar picture in the case of zirconium oxide um, anatase. Now coming over to titanium oxide bronze structure, you can see that there is some structural destabilization happening around 12 GPA, where the nanoparticles are uh, known to become disordered. And you can also see similar crossing of the evolution of the TIO bond lengths. So then I further calculated the despacing for different uh, planes, and you can see that there are crossings happening around 14 to 18 GPA. When you look at the experimental data, you've captured it earlier. Um, around 10 to 12 GPA where the disordering or the lattice stiffening happening. So you can see that you can gain insights um, into the experimentally, ex experimentally observed metastable structure at the nanoscale using a periodic boundary, I mean, periodic um, crystal calculations for anatase. And you can see that uh, this can be rationalized using the Initial, the quantum mechanical calculations, what's observed in the experiments. You can't squeeze bulk uh, anatase, it becomes um, a monoclinic phase or orthrhombic phase later. So you need to rely on some computational method. 
So just to summarize, resistant to, resistance to compression along the bond, short bond lengths because of the electron density increase is ultimately what's causing the destabilization uh, of the structure and amorphization. So that's what we can learn uh, from this exercise. Now, I, 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 I'll stop with the titania uh, TAO2 calculations. I move into boron nitride materials. Um, I will be talking about graphene and hexagonal boron nitride, their compression behaviors observed experimentally. And we'll be, we'll be looking at um, hydrogen, the role of hydrogen in um, tensile properties of graphene, HP, and hybrids. Don't worry, I'll be explaining these things in a second. And then we will look at briefly at boron nitride nanotubes, how molecular dynamics, yeah. Uh, molecular dynamics simulations can be used to understand the behavior of some of these materials. So let's start with uh, graphene and HPN. Graphene is shown here. Uh, this is a hexagonal lattice, single atom layer. Um, structure, the gray balls are carbon atoms. And well, HPN, the hexagonal boron nitride is essentially isostructural. Instead of carbon, we have alternating boron and nitrogen here. If you look at the electronic properties or electrical properties, graphene is a semi-metal, whereas um, HPN is an insulator. That means that these two are complementary materials. Now, starting with uh, graphene through topochemical uh, replacement of carbon atoms with boron and nitrogen in CVD process, you can create um, different uh, hybrid structures. So when we go from graphene, which is a semi-metal, all the way to hexagonal boron nitrogen, which is a uh, insulator, we are going through different uh, types of semiconducting states depending on the hybrid structures that create. So we can essentially tune the band gap when going from graphene to HPN through producing various hybrid structures. And this can be done using uh, a certain type of CVD uh, processes which uh, have been published by Gong et al in Nature Communications in 2014. So this one shows the experimental um, electron microscopic evidence for graphene, uh, starting with graphene, the full conversion to boron nitride. Now, um, if you start with graphene and if you use lithographic techniques and use some masks, you can also produce hybrid structures. Um, that means you are masking this graphene part and you're allowing this part of the graphene to undergo uh, topochemical substitution by boron and nitrogen. So you can produce hybrid structures. So why I want to show this is, these are important for uh, nanoelectronics. If you want to do nanoscale integrated circuits, or you want to play with the uh, band gap of the materials, these are the type of things you can do. And to do this kind of experiments, it's quite challenging and it's quite demanding. However, molecular dynamics and other ab initio calculations, meaning quantum mechanical calculations can be done and you can get uh, pretty much uh, similar results. That's what I am planning to show here. So if you look at uh, an experimental tensile test on HPN, this is a um, figure from this paper, Hanatar published in 2020. What they do is they make this um, uh, HPN here and attach it to so two sides using Van der Waals attachment or whatever they call it. And then they use what's called a push to pull um, or indentation uh, technique, wherein they put an indenter and push it down so that the material stretches. And then you can derive the elastic properties of such materials. I will show you a video of what they have done. So you can see that uh, the material is stretching now in this direction. And eventually it's breaking uh, in a brittle manner. So all these things are fantastic uh, results uh, obtained experimentally. But if you do computer simulations as these same people have done, you can 
study many of these properties without going through a lot of expensive equipment and a lot of trouble. You can get pretty similar results. In fact, um, in their paper, they have studied the role of defects such as grain boundaries, vacancies, etc., using both experiment and uh, molecular dynamic simulation using Stillinger Weber Potential and LAMS molecular dynamics software, which uh, Dr. Jacob Deathan has used a lot in his uh, PhD work. And they are able to get consist consistent results. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that some of these techniques are so powerful that you probably don't need to do experiments. Now, another possible way to play with the band gap of HP and E2 uh, and graphene is to do uh, experimentally you can hydrogenate. It. That means you can attach hydrogen uh, species on to carbon, boron, and nitrogen atom. And that way you are able to modify the band gap, which means from an insulator HP and you can make it uh, all the way to a metallic, uh, semi-metallic uh, graphene by just playing with the uh, hydrogen atoms it's by attaching different atoms and in different proportions. So that was uh, the motivation. Uh, of course, I'm talking here about hybrid structures. That means that uh, two structures, HPN and graphene in contact with each other contiguously without any grain boundary. And such materials are good for nanoelectronic applications. So uh, what, what's shown here is uh, Dr. Deathan, Jacob Deathan's work for his PhD and afterwards he did some work here where we have um, simulated uh, tensile properties of such a hybrid structure. Here, what you see is, uh, you can see the boron nitrate to the left and to the right is graphene and these yellow balls you see on top are hydrogen. So you create this in your computer and then you you clamp these two sides or select those two sides and apply uh, velocities uh, in opposite direction and you are pulling it apart and you can analyze the results after molecular dynamic uh, uh, runs and see what happens to the material, especially its elastic properties and uh, after elastic uh, properties, how it might uh, behave either in a ductile fashion or a brittle manner. So just to summarize uh, the results obtained for various uh, configurations of, of the hybrid structures, uh, what you can see is that uh, the Young's modulus as a function of temperature is uh, shown here for various configurations of um, hydrogenation. So this is pristine carbon, uh, graphene, pristine, meaning no modification, graphene as it is. You can see that um, it is very, uh, graphene and uh, HP and hybrid, I'm sorry. You can see that the at low temperature, the Young's modulus is high and with increasing temperature, it almost linearly um, decreases. On the other extreme is the fully hydrogenated structure. That means to in this material, for every atom, we have an attached hydrogen species sitting there. So it's fully hydrogenated. You can see that there's a huge drop in the Young's modulus. Young's modulus is the proportionality constant for, uh, of stress to strain, the Hooke's law, most of you are familiar with. I'm talking to the students here, not to the experts. I uh, apologize for that. And if you do different types of hydrogenations, uh, meaning different species, uh, different uh, carbon, chemical species are considered for hydrogenation. Here we see the hydrogenated carbon uh, case and then you can similarly for nitrogen and boron nitrogen etc. You can see that the Young's modulus uh, are much lower compared to pristine uh, hybrid material, and they span somewhere in between. If you look at um, the deformation behavior beyond elasticity, this this curve here to the right, the first curve shows the pristine material. It, it can withstand a, a stress of up to about 178 or 177 GPA before it fractures. So that's the fracture stress. Once you hydrogenate, you can in different ways or different configurations, you can see that the fracture stress is dropped uh, more than uh, by more than half. And then you can see, depending on the type of fracture, uh, 
hydrogenation, it can uh, uh, get different uh, fracture stress or ability to withstand um, fracture <clears throat> in these materials. And these uh, properties are useful when we are talking about um, using such hybrid materials in um, applications such as um, nanoelectromechanical systems or electronics, et cetera. We need to know how the fundamental properties vary. Now, this, this figure here shows uh, to the left um, fracture modes of the two types of uh, two situations. In the first case, to the left, A here is the fracture mode of non hydrogenated hybrid sheet. So, when you pull it, it withstands uh, stress up to about 170, whatever number I said, 78 GPA. And then after that, it cracks, but the crack appears in the bone nitrate segment of the hybrid. The carbon segment is intact, nothing has happened. However, if you take, I mean, we have done the simulations for different hybrid configurations, as I said. So let's just look at one of the configurations here, which is the carbon hydrogenated situation. And you can see that when you take this material, this hybrid material, the hydrogenated material beyond the elastic limit, it just cracks actually in the hydrogenated part. So essentially hydrogen is the weakening species. It weakens the material from a elasticity point of view, stiffness point of view, as well as uh, from a fracture stress point of view. So I think uh, I will leave um, the HPN hybrid um, graphene work there and I just quickly go over to some experiment uh, on multi-layer graphene here. This is a published uh, paper here. What is shown here is the compression of multi-layer graphene, X-ray diffraction study up to very high pressures. You can see that this is the diffraction peak of graphene. At some point, around 12 GPA, this peak disappears and the material become, becomes disordered. And this result is supported by Raman spectroscopic data also. So this was published by Clark, um, at all in solid state communication in 2013. It's supported by oh, Raman spectroscopic uh, data also. So this was published by Clark uh, at all in solid state communication in 2013. And it converts into a, another crystalline structure. It's more like a diamond most likely because it's a very stiff material, very difficult to compress and it's not disordering. So we were looking at uh, simulating this uh, work sometime in the near future, and then appears some experimental work on similar work on HP and hexagonal boron nitride, where they have tried to compress hexagonal boron nitride layers, starting with one layer, two layer, up to 10 layers, and to see what might happen under compression. They have done both um, experimental study using what's called um, Ongstrom indentation or um, uh, nano indentation. It's a modified form of nano. I'll show you the experimental setup in a second. And they look at what might happen to the material. So if you take the one layer case, you can see that the effective uh, modulus, this is the force versus indentation depth, is similar to that might happen in silica, which means the essentially the silica substrate that's used here is contributing to the modulus. So this is the one layer case here shown here, force versus uh, indentation depth. Uh, whereas when you go to two to three layers, there's a big increase in the stiffness or the resistance to indentation. That tells you that there is something happening in the material that's the two layers that is lying on top of the silica. So the effective modulus increases. Uh, and if you increase the number of layers up to 10, again, it doesn't show that kind of an increase. So what might be happening? Uh, this is the experimental setup that uh, I was talking about they use. It's called the modulated nano indentation, Ongstrom indentation. Essentially, it uses a, a combination of AFM, atomic force microscopy tip, which is uh, Ongstrom scale, very small scale, and that can penetrate very small um, thickness because these materials are uh, atomic thickness materials. So we are talking about 0.3 angstrom or something, and then it can uh, probe the material. So they have used this technique 
alongside some molecular simulation, molecular dynamic simulation to study what might happen. And the molecular dynamic simulation setup is shown here. They have created a, an equivalent molecular dynamic uh, simulation set setup where they have the silica, SiO2 here, substrate, which is modeled using some interthermic potential. I can't recall the details. You can look at this paper. It's just published in 2021, above which they have different layers of HP and one, two, three layer case here. So as they bring the indenter onto the material in the simulation, you can see that some green patches forming. That means that there is interlayer bonding happening. So when you look at the HPN, the bonding is largely what is called the SP2 bonding, which is essentially in-plane bonding, covalent bonding. But when you put two of these layers together and press, there is the, some of the SP2 bonding, the, the in-plane bonding is converted to SP3 bonding. That means there is bonding happening in between the layers. And, and that's what is shown here in this movie here. You can see that this bonding is metastable. That means that um, as soon as you release the pressure, the bonding is reversed and it goes from SP2 to SP3 when you compress it. And when you relax it, it comes back to the SP2 bonding. So that's what they have uh, found. And they were also able to compare the experimental elastic modulus, effective elastic modulus, because we are talking about a material lying on a substrate and its variation as a function of number of layers in the experiment. You can see that uh, when it's silica, it's about 60 GPA. Which, and if you have one layer, it's essentially same. That means we are measuring the elastic modulus of the silica substrate. But when you put two to three layers, the elastic modulus jumps up to 94 GPA. That means that there is this uh, SP3 bond layer forming, which is much harder to compress so the elastic modulus goes up. But when you increase the uh, number of layers beyond that, actually because of this stress situation in the, under the indenter, it's not transmitted completely and it's not really forming a lot of layers at the top. And that's what happens with the increased layering. What I want to show here is how similar result they are getting using molecular dynamic simulation. We are using, uh, I think, extended terms of interthermic potential and a molecular dynamics package called LAMPS, which uh, Dr. Jacob uh, Deathan has also used in his PhD work and still continues to use. So, so you don't need to do experiment, basically. You can do most of these things using computer simulations. Um, I don't know how, if I, how I'm running for time. Oh, I think I have exceeded my time. I'll probably quickly just show one or two slides on BNNT, which is boron nitrate nanotubes, which are important for many applications, including hydrogen storage and drug delivery. And nitrogen, BNNT was initially predicted based on carbon nanotube structure in 1994 using theoretical calculations and later which are experimentally synthesized. And that's the case with uh, some of the materials which I was uh, talking about earlier. Here you can see an electron micrograph uh, high resolution uh, showing the BNNT structure. If you dope the BNNT with uh, uh, aluminum, you are able to store significant amount of hydrogen. Now, Jacob's work, uh, which we are about to publish, shows how if you have a hybrid uh, structure, the, react of the reactive force field is able to capture some of the reaction that happens between the H2 species and the boron nitride part of it. Uh, I don't, I'm not uh, in a position to go in de into details of this work because um, we are still, we haven't still published it. So just quickly summarizing, we, I discussed briefly some of the computational tools available for modeling and simulating materials in nano, uh, useful for nanotechnology. We looked at some of the applications for nano TAO2 using periodic crystals, how we can learn uh, the compression or the mechanical behavior of nano TAO2, nano TAO2 zirconia structures. And finally, we looked at some of the boron carbide nanostructures. Uh, thank you for your patience and I apologize for the technical difficulties and the presentation suffered a bit, a bit because of I had to rush through it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take any questions you may have.
Okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Professor Fargusi. So interesting to see your presentation. Very good. And here is one question. It seems like uh, the question is, is curious about oxygen deficiency. Okay. The question is why oxygen deficiency is observed in the synthesis of TO2 nanoparticles? Uh, oh, it, it is in fact very hard to prepare stoichiometric materials. Mm -hmm. So it is not uncommon that you find um, um, oxygen deficiency in any of these synthetic systems. Okay. So it's, it's a common problem. Yeah, it's a defects are standard um, things in experimental uh, work. And that's why you can study some of this using uh, simulation models and see what might happen if you have a defective system. And maybe this is the last question. How can I build a TO2 cluster? Oh, that's, that's, uh, there are several methods. In fact, if they go into the literature, <laughs> This particular paper I was referring to, that uh, mm -hmm. realistic modeling of uh, TAO2 cluster, um, they talk about um, different methods available. You can create the structure using a lot of prob uh, programs. The, the trouble is, how do you take into account, particularly when you're going into smaller sized particle, how do you take into account the surface energy contributions like morphology, edge, and the vertex, the, these are the challenges. And that's pretty hard to do uh, when you are dealing with uh, ab initio calculations. I can refer the, uh, the, uh, the person to some work by Amanda Barnard. She has published few papers on how to do clusters. And then of course, this particular paper I was referring to, that paper kind of reviews uh, a lot of uh, literature on dealing with nano, um, crystals and clusters in TAO2. Okay, thank you, Professor, for your explanation, answering the questions. And I think uh, enough for the questions. Uh, yeah. We thank to Professor Fargusi Swami. Uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, your knowledge. And we hope it's useful to all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, thank okay. you for, uh, for having me. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. -bye. Okay, before we close this event, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Amin Suyitno, as the Dean of Science and Technology Faculty of Buddhidharma University, to give a closing speech. Okay. Please welcome Dr. Amin. Good afternoon. A big thank to everyone who attend our third international webinar series, including some participants <coughs> from overseas. From our attendance records, more than a thousand people have registered themselves, some of whom are from Pakistan, India, China, and Taiwan. We really appreciate all of you. Yeah, research in the field of nanotechnology in the last decade has development rapidly in a worldwide and wide application. It's shown from the number of patterns in the world with the application of nanotechnology and more in the field of such as construction material, medicine, pharmaceutical, agriculture, and also food processing. Now on, the other field like uh, electronic and uh, energy, mostly battery, is also increased. Hopefully, with the present webinar, this topic and material presented by Associate Professor Farkis Swami can inspire all of us, open it our idea as well as reach topic for our lecture. The more so we can conduct joint research, it still be nice. We, have, we also have to say many thanks to Associate Professor Parki Swami, who provides us with a very useful presentation and excellent material. Therefore, on behalf of our institu institution, Buddhidharma University, 
I have to appreciate your contribution to this such international webinar, and I hope I, uh, our relationship will continue in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I hope uh, I do continue with, uh, I will continue with your collaboration with some of your staff, particularly Jacob. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, we <laughs> <You> also. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, professor, uh, sorry, there is uh, one question, uh, yeah. one more question. In molecular dynamics modeling using React FF, does uh, do you have to do you have to enter a potential mo model into the program script? Yes, all all uh, atomistic calculations require a interatomic potential and model. Uh, depending on the system and uh, with uh, some of the standard packages like LAMS or that most people use, there is an interatomic potential library available uh, with that program. Otherwise, we can input uh, the parameters into the program. Should be should be possible. Yeah, you need a, an interatomic potential model to do molecular dynamics. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, and finally, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Amin, yeah, for your closing speech. Thank you, Professor yeah. uh, Fargiswani. And thank finally, you. I would like to say thank you very much again, yeah, uh, for uh, your presentation. We are really grateful for your knowledge sharing today. And to Dr. Titi, Mr. Udaya, yeah, for uh, the opening speech and all participants who have joined this event. I hope we could see you again on next international webinar series of Bodhidharma University. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye.